You're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake. Oh, you move me. Your freedom is consuming. I feel it rushing through me. I'll never be the same. My heart beats only for your glory. Amen. Lord, I thank you. Hey, it's great to see you here. How about we stand and we'll sing one together. We'll even put the words up there so you can sing along with us. There's an endless song echoes in my soul when I hear the music ring and then though the storms may come I am holding on to the rock I claim oh how can I from singing your praise, how can I ever say enough? How amazing it's your love! How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King. want to see I will lift my eyes in the darkest night and I know my Savior lives. oh I thank you oh and I will walk with you knowing you'll see me through oh and I'll sing song you give but how can I keep from singing your praise how can I ever say enough how amazing is your love how can I keep from shouting your In the troubled times And sing when I win I can sing when I lose my step And fall down again I can sing cause you pick me up And sing cause you're there I can sing cause you hear me Lord When I call to you in prayer can sing with my last breath and sing for I know that I'll sing with the angels and the saints around the throne. How can I keep from singing your praise? Oh, how could I ever say enough? How amazing From shouting your name, I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I know I'm loved. 
I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. Have you come to worship the Lord? Woo! Me too. Will you join me and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we stop what we're doing in the busyness of life and we're here to focus on you. Lord, we declare how much we love you. We turn our attention to you and thank you, Lord, for your great faithfulness to us. Father, today would you help us to absorb all that you have for us today. Lord, whether it's singing the truth or, or the word that we hear preached, Holy Spirit, we just, right now, in this moment, make ourselves vulnerable to you, and we ask you for revelation. We ask you for transformation. Help us, Lord, to love our community well. And Father, while we're together, we want to lift up Jeff and Kathy Kevin, Steve, Dan, Jennifer, Lord, and, and many others who need a touch from you today. Father, right in the middle of what they're facing, we pray that your comforting presence would surround them and encourage them and give them hope for today and for tomorrow. Lord, and we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Great to see your smiley faces. If I haven't met you, I'm Pastor Robin. I'm our executive pastor of operations, and I also get the pleasure of being Pastor Mike's assistant. So I'm kind of like a Swiss Army knife. I get to do a whole lot of things. I do have some announcements for us, but before we get to our announcements, um, I want to just address our visitors. If you are joining us here in the building or if you're joining us online, I just have a few things to share with you just to help you relax. <laughs> we know what it's like when you go to a new church. Every church does things just a little bit differently. Um, firstly, you may notice that when we go into the song portion of our worship service, there may be people around you who raise their hands. Raise their hands. Sorry. Raise their hands. And they don't have a question. <laughs> There's no right or wrong way to worship. But it's important that we worship. Amen? Amen. So I want to invite you into that. The other thing is to let you know that um, all of the announcements and things that I'll be sharing with you are in our bulletin. We do have a hard copy bulletin back on the ushers table, or it's available online at realchurch.org. And so please check that out, because there's a whole lot of great information um, to just get you equipped, help you be informed, know what's coming up. Um, I do want to let you know, though, uh, if you're visiting, please go to the website. Right in the middle of the page is the Connect icon, and if you would click on that and fill out that information, we would just love to know that you are visiting with us today. You're not going to go on any sort of mailing list or anything, um, but I do want to encourage you, if you have a question about the church or um, question about serving or anything, uh, prayer request, please put that in the comments because we would love to be able to pray with you or get you the information that you need. I do want to highlight also, speaking of prayer, you're going to notice that when we're we're in worship, um, there will be people over at the crosses. This is our altar prayer team who are trained. If you have a prayer request, please come up and have them pray with you. They would love to do that. Sound good? Maranatha, will you join me and let's give our visitors a really warm welcome. Woohoo! Okay, so I do want to highlight this week's bulletin. We've been having this really fun thing where people in the congregation have been sending in their high-resolution photos, and this week's photo is from Chloe Gruby. Isn't that cool? Proud mama over here, yeah. Very fun. So if you would like your photo highlighted, we would love to do that. Please send that in to communications at realchurch.org, and we'll get that in the queue. Okay. 
announcements. I want to let you know that our giving statements have been sent out. Uh, if there is an email online, they've been emailed, please check your spam folder because sometimes that happens. And the hard copy ones were sent out this past Friday, so those should be coming to you. If you have any questions, please call Jessica and we will get that squared away for you. I also want to let you know we do have a couple of opportunities around the church to get involved. Specifically, uh, one of them is our clean team. If you enjoy cleaning, we would love to have you. And I got to say, I am just so encouraged by the creative ways people have been uh, involved in the clean team. Um, many of you know Robert Brown, and he is in a laid off period. He called up the office and he's like, I've got a couple hours. What would you like me to do? So we've been keeping Robert busy all week long. If you have a window of time that you'd like to do anything, we would love to have you on the team. So please connect with us. Information is in the bulletin or up here on the Tron, and uh, we'll get you plugged in. The other volunteer opportunity that I want to highlight to you is our Real Church Buddies, a program that we've started in the children's department um, where adults come alongside kids who may need just a little extra support during their time in the children's department during service. So if that's at all intriguing to you, Pastor Tina would love to hear from you. What you. Oh, you're, great. Hi. You're, you're echoey. Am I? Yes. Okay. So we're going to undo that. And... Person. Isn't it great to have Michelle here to keep there. us all? There you go. Awesome. Well, thank you for bearing with that. You know, technology, as Pastor Mike says, it's just all going to burn one day. <laughs> and that'll be a great day. In, in some aspects. Um, so yes, the RC buddies in the children's department. Um, so if you're interested in getting more information about that, please connect with Pastor Tina. She would love to help you out with that. Um, I would like to highlight our cup of faith. Take a look at the cool specials that they have going on this video. Welcome to the cup of faith here at Maranatha. This is where the baristas work their magic and they come up with new monthly specials all the time. So, what's new on the schedule right now is what? Go ahead. Okay, Heather. so our first one is our frozen snowflake right here. It is caramel, vanilla, and espresso blended with ice. That's a winner. I'm keeping yeah. that one. Yeah. All right. Nice. I'm keeping that one. That nice. was good. Okay, what's All right, next? So, our next one is our toasted snowflake white chocolate, cinnamon, espresso, and steamed milk. Actually, you guys are really good because I can taste the cinnamon in there, I can taste the espresso, um, the white chocolate. Um, the sweet, this is great. Even though it's got steamed milk, I can't tell. Well, we also have coconut milk and mm. almond milk, you know, to add in there. I can drink this like this, too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That's right. really good. Okay, what's next? So our last one is the melted snowflake. This is dark chocolate, caramel, salt, espresso, and steamed milk. A melted snowflake. My wife is going to be so sad. Both marvelous. Oh, my gosh. Good to know. Mmm. Man, I'm gonna drink quite a, quite a bit here this morning. So then, our peppermint tea. I know you're not a huge tea drinker, but this was everybody's favorite, and so we extended it another two months. You're right, not my favorite. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. It is. That is good. That is good. I have to admit, not my favorite. That's okay. All these other three, home runs. Home run. Home run. January through February, yep. these drinks are available, and consider being a barista. <laughs> Lots of stuff at the Cup of Faith. I want to encourage you to come and try those out. Like Pastor Mike and Heather mentioned, there's just a limited opportunity uh, to take up on those. And at the same time, you can pray for the staff. Because as you can imagine, after, after Pastor Mike has had three cups of coffee, okay, we'll just leave that there. <laughs> I do want to let you know that our kindergarten readiness is enrolling for the next school year for four and five-year-olds. It's a half-a-day preschool. Um, please connect with Jaden. She can give you more information. And gentlemen, dun -dun 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 -dun. it's this Friday night. What's happening? It's a wild game dinner. I'm so excited for you guys. So I do want to let you know that tickets are on sale in the lobby today and also at realchurch.org. But I know. Okay, so there's some gentlemen out there going, okay, I am come to the day. I forgot to get it online. I forgot to get it in the lobby. I shouldn't come. No, come anyway. 
You can get tickets at the door if you need to. So I want to encourage you to come. Um, we do have a special speaker, Jim Ramos, who is a, inter, a national speaker. It's going to be great. So please come, grab your guy friends, and awesome. The next day, I want to encourage you to please come to the men's conference that we're having. Jim Ramos is staying, and he's uh, sharing from 8.30 to 2, so it doesn't take up your whole day, but you're going to be encouraged. So really, like I mentioned last week, whether you swear... <laughs> Goodness. So whether you wear skinny jeans or dress slacks or Carhartt pants, please come because this event will encourage you. You'll have a great time. Sound good? Sound good? Awesome. Okay, gentlemen, you're with me. So next we move into Breaking Stereotypes. Let's listen to Pastor Mike. Welcome to Breaking Stereotypes. Before I begin, I got to make sure you notice my shirt. Pastor Gail got this for me. When she's seen it, she said, I thought of you right away. Anyway. Breaking Stereotypes is about American history, knowing the foundation of our country, where we came from. And I'm, again, I'm always amazed, and I know that you will be as well. Listen, listen to this. The Constitution of the State of Massachusetts states, We, therefore, the people of Massachusetts, acknowledging with grateful hearts the goodness of the great legislator of the universe, in affording us in the course of his providence, in other words, the opportunity to form a compact, and devoutly imploring his direction in so interesting a design. In other words, establishing the Constitution. All this time giving credit and thanks to God. Then they have these instructions. The governor shall be chosen annually, and no person shall be eligible to this office unless at the time of his election he shall declare himself to be of the Christian religion. Wow. wonder how many governors and legislators we'd have today if that was one of the uh, prerequisites. Just a thought. Chapter 6, Article 1. All persons elected to state office or to the legislature must make and subscribe the following declaration. Quote, I, insert name, do declare that I believe the Christian religion and have firm persuasion of its truth. Part 1, Article 2. It is the right as well as the duty of all men in society, publicly, and at stated seasons to worship the supreme being, the great creator and preserver of the universe. No subject shall be hurt, molested, or restrained in his person, liberty, or estate for worshiping God in the manner and seasons, most agreeable to the dictates of his own conscience. Wow. Part 1, Article 3. Every denomination of Christians, demeaning themselves peaceably and as good subjects of the commonwealth, shall be equally under the protection of the law, and no subordination of any sect or denomination to another shall ever be established by law. This is where we get this idea of the separation of church and state. Basically, they left England. They were no longer going to make a denomination but a religion, fundamental, Judeo-Christian values. Something to think about. Isn't that amazing? Man, the people of Massachusetts in 1780 had it going on. We sing, we sing to you today, Jesus. We give you the glory and the honor. No matter what state our world is in, no matter what state our nation is in, God, we give you the glory and the honor that's due your name, and nothing can keep us from singing. Nothing in Jesus' name. Oh, how can I keep from singing your name? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting? I am loved by a king, and it makes my heart. Oh, I am loved by a king, and it makes my heart. I am loved by a king, and it makes my heart want to sing. We sing that. 
that because you are the Lord, the famous one.
criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose without freedom and hand That's when death was arrested in my Oh, your grace so free washes over so hard to see it and it took me so long to believe it that you chose someone like me to carry your victory perfection could never earn it and you give what we don't deserve and you take the broken things Give them to glory. You are my champion. The giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won. And who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated. With the one who has conquered it all And now I can finally see it You're teaching me how to receive it So you and all the striving cease and This is my victory Cause you are my champion Giants following you stand undefeated every battle you won. I am who you say I am. You crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Oh, you conquered it all. When I open up my eyes, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. Yes, Jesus has given me. And when I open up my mouth, miracles start breaking out. I have the authority. battle you won. I am who you say I am. 
You crowd me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place. I'm defeated by the power of your name. I am seated in the heavenly place. I'm defeated with the one who has conquered it all. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. There's no swall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Let's sing that again. Oh, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, there's no wall you won't kick Me. Oh, oh, you're our Savior, Lord. Oh, you're awesome. You're amazing. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down before.
my Savior, to my love, Jesus. Praise God. God is so good all the time. The first stanza of that song that, you know, he would use someone like us. Where is that? Oh. Yeah, right, 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 right. Okay. I realize you're still standing. Last Sunday, I talked about how, uh, you know, people believe that God is alive today, uh, and, and they see him when they see you responding in obedience to what he's asked you to do. Because people are amazed that God would use somebody like you. Right? I mean, every one of us, they look at you and they go, because they knew your life, they knew your past, and, and they see God using you to do things, and they're going, wow, there's a God. And I've tried so hard to see it. Took me so long to believe it. That you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We give glory to your name. We thank you for your miracle working power. That we were born again into the family of God. Through the confession of our sin and our belief that you died in our place. God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Praise God. As we get ready to take the offering this morning, I want to just show you a quick picture. Last Sunday, as I left church, I went out to my vehicle. Okay, so I went out to my truck, and that's what I saw. So somebody among here, you guys are listening. It's like, oh my gosh, and you were very, very creative. Uh, pretty wild. Um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm just going to, if I ever end, if I ever end up telling the story again, I need to stand corrected. I, I just realized as I, because I didn't plan on saying that last week and things like that happen, and but I'm telling the story. It was really close. It has just a slight difference. I remembered the bumper sticker on the side of the door of my dad's truck was the difference in me is Jesus, right? That was the bumper sticker. So I'm driving my dad's truck as a 16-year-old smoking pot, driving, you know, and I'm driving, and I ran the door. It's the difference in me is Jesus. Okay, now, but, but this, this was a bumper sticker that I put on my car. That's salvation. Amen. That's conversion. Amen? Because the difference in me was Jesus and I just fretted to take the truck out because I had to drive it with that bumper sticker, a bumper sticker on the side of the door. The difference in me is Jesus, but I got saved. And I put a bumper sticker that said that on my car bumper. Pretty cool. Yes, I did, because I got two, and I went over, and I, I went over and slipped one on his van door. So, yeah, that's how his door. So, one of you out there is very, very conniving tricky. And I would, I would really love to, just out of curiosity, to find out who did it. <laughs> Praise God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your incredible grace that lives change that we are not ashamed. We boldly want to proclaim and live the life that you've given us. We are amazed that you would use someone like us to declare your glory. Father, right now we worship you, not only with our, our lips, but even now the tangible evidence, the first part going to you, because you are first in our life in every aspect. Father, we worship you with this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. You make the darkness run and hide. You bring the broken back to life. Only you can. You. you set me free from every chain and fill my heart with songs of praise. Only you can, only you can. Oh, Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. I am wide awake.
Jesus, you're the only reason that I'm even breathing. And I am wide awake. Oh, you fool me. Your feeling is consuming. I feel it rushing through me. I never be the same. Praise God. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm not sure if you ever really noticed the drummer back there, but Robert was about jumping out of his chair today. <laughs> just leaping out of his chair, just going kind of crazy. Um, for those of you who are visiting with us and those watching online, uh, the third Sunday of the month, we are always trying to keep missions for, fixed it, for, forever fixed in the forefront of our mind that we don't forget it. You know, Jesus said... Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. I believe everybody, Christian, should tithe and should give to missions. I think there's other things we can give to as well, special needs and things that come up. But missions ought to take a primary spot to care for the lost. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. And we, as we invest in missions. So we take a second offering um, the third Sunday of the month. Uh, so the usher is going to do a quick turnaround and... and um, I realize, again, some of you, those watching online, and some of you, you, it's all done on your computer, your giving is all taken care of, but um, for many of us, this is a reminder, and it's, it's, it's good to come and to give um, to missions. Our missions highlight this month is Charles and Tanya Porter. They have children, Joshua, Elena, and Riley. Um, one quote that they shared with us is, if something happens when you pray, something doesn't happen when you don't. Hey, that's, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Never really thought about it quite that way before, but man, if something happens when you pray, something doesn't when you don't. They've been serving in Montreal, Quebec. Only 6% of the population there is born again. Um, they're targeting the French-speaking university students. Je m'appelle Michel, comment allez-vous? Il fait beau, oui? Oui, oui? Chapeau? Chemise? Pensez? Écoutez? Or écoutez? Pensez? Sure. <laughs> Très belle? Very beautiful? Um, that's all the French I know. So if I was trying to convince you that I speak French, uh, I don't. Obviously, like most universities, uh, they, they noted that universities, uh, they have severe party and it's a severe party and drinking environment, uh, developing podcasts to reach out to more people. Um, they've asked that we would pray for more young people to be called into the ministry. Pray for the university, university students in this area to be impacted by the love of Jesus. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the ushers to come. We're going to pray and lift up Charles and Tanya Porter. And um, we're going to take an offering for missions. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Father, we do come to you, and it is our pleasure to lift up Charles and Tanya Porter as they are ministering uh, in a place where there is not a strong evangelical witness as close to us as Canada. Father, we pray for more young people to be called into the ministry to replace the aging pastors all through Canada and we'd add even here in the United States. Father, we pray for university students to be impacted with the love of Jesus. We pray for their upcoming podcast that they're trying to develop. Father, that you would just orchestrate, give them direction, give them creativity. Put all the necessary things together that they're going to need to have these effective podcasts. Father, we pray for them as they navigate how difficult it is in isolation of moving from one place to another in an area where they don't know anybody. 
And Father, we also just continue to lift up their support. Financially, the blessings that they need, Father, from your people to keep them where they are, faithfully serving you. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God is good. All the time. There's no special. I'm going to give you a few moments to come and give as we receive the offering. Um, Let me make a, a, a quick comment. Some of you are, are loving this winter. I know I am. It's been easy so far. Right? It didn't start early. It's been easy. Mason, it's been easy. It hasn't really been like cold, cold just till the last couple of weeks. And we haven't got a lot of snow. I mean, and think about it. We're in the middle of January. I can see spring in the future. Right? I just keep thinking every day that goes by, we're just getting that much closer. Right, Diane? That is one fancy shirt you got on today. Wow, you're styling. That looks good. Thank you very much. Praise God. So last week was kicking off the, the New Year's emphasis. Um, to your calling will be true in 22. To your calling will be true. Now, this morning, I want to piggyback on that for a little bit and let you know that today is kind of setting up where we're going to be next week. Okay, next week we're going to talk about to love God. What does it mean to love God? We hear it all the time. We should love God. What does that mean? Tragically and too often, what it means is it's so easy for us to grow into a religious spirit, a Pharisee, where we start thinking, well, loving God is doing all these rules and keeping all this stuff. Anyway, so this morning, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that Christianity is, is serious. It's not a game. And too often we, we mess around with it like it's a game. Um, I, I don't know, Chuck Swindoll, I, I, I remember reading it one time, and some of you might, out there might know it, but he said, we, we play at our worship. We worship our hobby and we rest at work or something. I don't know. <laughs> but this idea that we got things kind of mixed up. The thing that should be the most serious in our life, our faith, we just play at it. Yeah, when it's convenient, when it's easy, kind of when it's, you know, it feels good. This emphasis of what am I really supposed to be doing? Now, I want to let you know, if you've been Kevin to Maranatha for a long time, um, Try not to fall asleep during the rest of my message. Because this is going to seem irrelevant. You're going to kind of wonder, what, what, what are you talking about? It's like, I don't get it. But those of you who have come from other churches, your Christian background, run into people like this all the time. I have this phrase, and some of you have heard me say it. And again, if you're newer to Maranatha, you've heard me say it. Christianity is not a game. I want to talk a little bit about that. Okay? Um, because growing is serious. I ended last week with talking about you. What is your calling that you need to be true to? Number one, you need to be growing in your love for God. It's called discipleship. Number two, you need to be growing in your service to God. It's called obedience. And then thirdly, you need to be growing in your commitment to the body. You know, I'll, I'll tell you what, my, through my Christian years, you know, I'm old now. I can look back and see a lot of things. You know, I have my whole life, I've always seen these wanderers. They're never, we're growing committed to a church. Uh, they go here, then they go there, then they flop around there, whatever else. And then, you know, the pastor said something they didn't like, or somebody offended, and they bounce around. Now, because you leave a church, doesn't mean that, you know, there's something wrong with you. There's good reasons to leave a church. But I'm talking about these people who they just never knew what it was like to tie into and grow up and be, get your roots down and get in, committed to a body. The body of Christ, the church, is so weak because there's not this idea of commitment to the body. You need to be committed. My dad used to use this phrase all the time, you know, these people who are floaters just running around because Christ is the head and we together are the body. 
And if you're not in the body, you're just a finger sticking out the head. Amen. Amen. I remember talking to this one guy, again, he, he, he really was, uh, you know, the, the kind of that thing that really kind of turns my crank in a very negative way. Um, it's easy to push my buttons, and somebody like this really does, and because he, he ran around, and he, he, he literally referred to himself as, I'm a judge of the churches. That's a, who gave him that job? I did not find that in the, Wow. He went to church after church and he found this problem there and this is wrong here. And, and he told me that, you, you know, for me personally, um, several things he didn't like. He said, you are too theatrical from the pulpit. <laughs> you, have, you have too much fun. You have too much fun. You have too much, you know, whatever. I'm like, wow. Another thing he said, too, is you preach tithing. He obviously didn't believe in tithing. Well, he wasn't committed to a church. It's like, anyway. He was so legalistic about so many, every little thing. And I, one day in a conversation with him, I said, you know what's really sad? I said, you have yourself a brand new baseball unit, a uniform. Man, your shirt is lily white. It's got the stripes, man. It's pleated. It's, it's, it's custom tailored for you. You got a brand new bat and you just want to play ball. You have a nice hat. Oh my gosh, you are so spiffed. You are ready to play. You got a brand new glove. I can see you got a brand new glove. And you're out there on the field waiting to play ball. Problem is, you're on the wrong field. Everybody's over here. You see, Christianity is not a game. It's too serious for us just to kind of mess around. Heaven and hell are real. And even as you and I, and I agree with you, and say amen, does the terror of hell really scare us? The Bible says, Apostle Paul said, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Some Christians have interpreted that mean, so we got to scare the hell out of people. we got to put the fear of hell in them. It's like, no, that's not what that verse says. The verse says, you and I. Knowing that awful day of judgment, that terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We are filled with the passion and the compassion. For the love of Christ compels me, Paul said. I have to do this because I know that judgment day is coming and everybody will stand before the throne of God. That's serious stuff, but unfortunately the church, we're just busy playing a game. We want to make sure we're doing this right and we're doing that right. And it's like we got all this, you know, something, a lot of the stuff that we value as important really don't matter at all. There's a lot at stake. Like I said, Revelation 3.20. There, there's a couple verses in the Bible that really, I mean, really bug me, haunt me. Revelation 3.20 is one of them, and I'll, I'll get back to that, but I'll tell you another one. It's uh, the story of Samson's life. You know, Samson was messing around with his anointing, messing around with his gift. And Delilah would cry, would cry, oh, the Philistines are upon you, the Philistines are upon you. And he'd go out and he'd shake himself. And the Spirit of God would come down and then he'd, you know, kick butt. Tragic verse. The Philistines are upon you, the Philistines are upon you. He says, I will go out as at other times and shake myself. And the, and the, and the Spirit of God will come upon me. Here's the tragic verse. He did not know the spirit had left him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to play around playing Christianity as a game oh, I, and, and do nothing wrong. Oh, I, can, I know how to sound right and be lily white and whatever else. I'm going to fight for the things that are important. Truth, integrity, character, the things that are really important. I don't want to mess around with, do you smoke or do you drink or do you dance? Do you gamble? I mean, this whole, I, I, you know, I've read the Bible many times. I don't understand what, why the church has made a big deal about gambling. Who? it just got quiet in here. You know, um, if you love to go to a movie, 
you're going to drop quite a few bucks out to a movie, out to dinner. If somebody likes it, and, and believe me, I don't get it. Uh, this is not me condoning it. What I'm trying to say is, why are we making a big deal out of it? If somebody, for some reason, likes putting money in a machine, going, and watching things go, if, they get, if that gets the crank, that, you know, just gets them all riled up, and that's their form of entertainment, is that really a big deal? If you limit yourself, the, the idea of gambling as a negative thing is when you, are, when you, you think you're going to make a living, you, you think you're going to get rich doing this. Okay, I wasn't even planning on going. But that's just one of a, a multitude of these things. There's people dying and going to hell without a relationship with Christ. They don't know the, the life-giving joy of knowing Jesus, being born again. And yet the church is busy worrying about, well, do you do this and do you do that? Friends, there's a lot, to, a lot at stake here. So John, uh, Revelation 3.20 is that other verse that just, it just haunts me. It is, it is a sobering, oh my gosh, do we understand this? So the first one was Samson, you know, but the other one is Revelation 3.20. Or, uh, 20, 20, no, it's Revelation 20, verse I said 320 in my notes. Don't put it up there. It's not the right one. Verse 2015, I believe, is the verse. See if you can get 2015 up there. See how fast these guys are. <laughs> Revelation 2015. Here's the verse. If anyone's name was not found written in the book, he was cast into the lake of fire. I don't know about you, but that's serious stuff. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. That verse bugs me. I don't like it. And that's why Christianity is not a game. It's not a game. You know, have you ever um, learned a new game? Here, here's how this thing goes. Quite a few years ago, I, again, I preached a whole sermon series on life. Christianity is not a game. I'm not going to do that whole series right now, but, you know, um, I, I love, have you, have you ever heard of Shanghai? The card game Shanghai? A couple years ago, we learned that, and, and now, I don't play many games. I just don't like games. I'm not a game player. And, but I do like Shanghai, because you don't got to think about that, and it really doesn't matter. Does it matter? If you win, if you like, just play the game. Um, so whenever you learn a new game, somebody, they you know, encourage you, you come over, you're going to play a new game, so they can explain it to you. So they tell you, here's how you play it, you're going to get so many hands, and we're going to run you know, through 11 hands, and everything, you're trying to collect these, and then we're going to do a runs, and then straights, and two runs and a straight, and then two, two, run, two straights and a run, and, we're gonna, and, and you're like, mine's going along, and you're, they're, they're explaining the rules to you. Um, every game is like this, Monopoly, Sorry. Okay, so sorry. When you're, when you're going along with your, your little guy and you get to the, at the beginning of one of those arrows, okay, so do you play that you have to land on that arrow at the very beginning and then you get to slide and then keep counting? Or is it when you, if you end up anywhere on there then you can slide to the end? <laughs> I love it. Those of you online, you can't see the discussion going on, but everybody's kind of arguing. They're just saying, no, if you can land right in the very end. In other words, no, you can land anywhere on there, then you can go to the end, and it's, it's kind of incredible. You can kind of pick and choose. Like any game, uh, you're introduced to a new game by friends, and then they start explaining it to you how to play, and, and they're doing their very best how to explain it to you. And then they say, well, here's the thing. You're going to learn as you go, so let's just start the game and you'll, you'll just learn, watch me, follow us, we'll correct you, we'll help you out, we'll, you know, in playing the game. So um, it's confusing at first, but it doesn't take too long and because, you know, you guys are all pretty sharp and people are teaching this game and you, you kind of pick up on it and you go, oh, yeah, okay, I get the hang of this. And, and then every once in a while you really get it. You go, oh, yeah, hey, look at this, you know, or ch -ch 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 whatever the game is. You begin to get it and all of a sudden you start making some good moves and some good plays and and then eventually you end up winning a hand or you win a game. You win and you're like, wow, 
it's euphoric. It's like, wow, but you didn't really do anything. It was just a game. <laughs> you did not, you know, win any money. You didn't win a medal. You didn't, there's no trophy. Um, just kind of uh, playing a game. Just a game. Now, I think there's benefits to playing a game. Don't get me wrong. You get together, you get to socialize, you get to visit with people, you know, and all that's good. But the tragedy is, you think about, we treat Christianity like a game. I know that when I got saved and started coming around and hanging around the church and started following people and listening and watching how Christians live their life, I thought, oh, wow, I, I quickly picked up on their lingo. I started speaking fluent Christianese. <laughs> I started finding out right away that certain words, oh, made people uncomfortable. Certain actions, certain demeanors, certain attitudes, passion, different things that you do. Oh, it's like, oh, we, we don't do that. We don't do that. And, and, and you learn how to play the game, kind of make your way through. And it was kind of crazy because then as I was continued to, to dis, get discipled and grew in the Lord, reading my Bible, I found out that some of the things that these people who taught me how to play the game weren't following the rules. Jesus said, don't judge by appearance, but judge with the right judgment. And they were teaching me that, oh man, you got to dress this way, talk this way, act this way, live this way. It's kind of crazy. I'm going to make a lot of you uncomfortable right now, but Paul in the book of Colossians says, why do you submit to rules? Do not touch, do not taste, do not whatever. These indeed have an appearance of promoting rigor of devotion, but have no value checking the indulgence of the flesh. Last week I talked about the things that, you know, we, we value and we, we put a lot of importance on, but, you know, as the church. But the weightier matters, the serious heart issues, we never talk about. And we're full of it. Friends, Christianity is not a game. You quick learn the spoken and the unspoken rules of what game playing is. You know, you wear Christian jewelry, score five points. Put a bumper sticker on your car. Score 10. <laughs> Listen only to Christian music. 10 points. You pray, and when you do and you talk, you speak in King James Version. Move ahead, eight spaces. <laughs> I, I never got that. You know, I'm around somebody. There was, and again, I don't, I don't mean to make fun, but I do want it for the point of emphasis. You guys, it's, we, we, we play the game. I remember we come in, and this, this one guy, bless his heart, and I love him, he was a good brother. But you'd be talking to them, just like this, you'd be talking. All of a sudden, I am not exag- I'm, I'm not going to exaggerate. I'm going to try to model it as close as I can. And all of a sudden, you go to prayer. Oh, God, we bless thee in thy holiness, and we pray. That, uh, did you, where did you learn that? I didn't know there was a special... God language that he expected us to talk to him in. So much of this stuff is learned. You learn how to play the game. Reverence, be reverent. Friends, I'm not making fun of being reverent. But we talk to God the way we talk. There is nothing extra sanctimonious about praying in King James Version. We come to thee in thine power. And, nah. If you don't smoke or drink, you, you go directly to go collect $200. Friends, none of these are bad. It's not bad to wear Christian jewelry. It's not bad to not smoke or not drink. It's not bad to put bumper stickers on your car. You can do all that stuff. But just realize how important it is in the scheme of things. You see, Christianity is not a game. Society, I believe, wants to believe there's a God. Because the Bible says, put in every man is a knowledge of God. So in the inner man, I think even your most crudest atheist, I think he's a, he's a crude, beat-up atheist because he's, he's hurting so bad, but he's seen Christians that just play the game. The real stuff, when tested, isn't there. Oh, but they don't smoke. Oh, they don't drink. 
and they're judgmental about this, and they, but they don't love people. They're judgmental of people. I think people really want to believe there's a God. If that's true, then it is imperative that you and I get better at worshiping God. That we worship him. I'm not talking about just Sunday morning when we're here corporately, but that your life is a reflection of worship to God. It is imperative that you and I walk with God. Not a religious game playing. I mean, walk with God. We'll be talking about that next week a little bit. Like I said, man, you and I, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That people can see and taste and see that the Lord is good from our life. I love it. Faith, hope, and love. These three remain, but the greatest of these is love. Man, we, we should spend so much time on love. I, I came across a little a pamphlet a while ago. It's um, 15 characteristics of today's unchurched person. I'm going to read 12 of them to you. Just I'm going to try to glance through them. As I said, I, I believe... Most people want to know there's a God. I remember as a little kid, I, you know, I went to church. I believed that there was God. And I really wanted to believe there was a God. I remember honestly, earnestly praying, God, if that's really your body, would you bleed? When I taste the cup, I want to taste blood. I want to be real. I'm not into it. I don't want to play a game. We waste so much time and effort. Do you realize how much money the church spends every year just keeping the lights on in churches and this, this machine rolling? We do the work of the church, but that is not necessarily the work of God. Here, just let me enlighten you. This is uh, what some surveys have found. This is what they out there are thinking and how they're living. Number one, they don't all have big problems. You know, you and I, we paint anybody who doesn't have a relationship with Christ like, oh my God, their life is horrible and they're, they're going to hell and their life's a mess and they're you know, wondering where they're going to make their next payment and they're worried about their car breaking down. And everything. Hey, no, guess what? There's people out there that don't know Jesus that their life is pretty comfortable. And you come up and try to take their ice cream cone from them. <laughs> if you've been in membership class, you know what I'm talking about. Everybody's going through life and they got an ice cream cone. They like their ice cream cone. And you and I tell them their ice cream cone's bad. You, you got to get rid of that ice cream cone. It's going to kill you. And, and, and they get really protective of their ice cream cone. No, my life is fine. What do you mean? I don't get... And we insist on taking their ice cream cone from them. Friends, you know something with people out there? Their life's not, not all of their lives are falling apart. If we only know how to speak into discontent and crisis, we will miss most of our neighbors. If that's all we know how to talk about and look for is the people whose lives are just a mess. Oh, and trust me, you know it. Without Christ, your life oftentimes is there, but not all. Some people are quite content living, sleeping in on Sunday. No, those who are watching at home, they're, at least they're up. You know, they're not at Bedside Baptist. They're watching, tuned in. Number two, they feel less guilty than you think. Again, being a believer, you and I think that they're just guilty about fornication and adultery. And, you know, they're, they're cheating from their, their neighbors and they're lying and they're what. Guess what? That didn't bother them. It's us moralists that impose upon them and make them feel, try to make them feel uncomfortable. You got to remember, until you knew Jesus, until you knew the gospel, until somebody told you what you're doing is wrong, you didn't know it was wrong. Sinners sin. That's what they do, and they don't feel guilty for that. Number three, occasional is regular. 
In other words, some of this, this whole new thing, um, church statistics tell us today that your average person now goes to church once every six weeks. And they're talking about people like you. Now, I'm glad that you are more regular than that. But there's a lot of people, even who would call Maranatha their home, uh, the Chisago Lakes campus their home, the, whatever church their home, they only go once every six times, once every six weeks. And they think that's committed. That's just the way it is. Number four, most are spiritual. Most unchurched people believe in God. They believe in some kind of God. I mean, they believe that God's out there, but they don't know him until we get to explain who Jesus is. But you see, you know, you and I usually make the mistake of chalking them up to, they're all atheists. They're not atheists. They're spiritual people. Like I said, I believe most people want to believe that there's a God. You and I have a ripe opportunity to demonstrate for them that there is. And we know him. Okay, number five. They're not sure what Christian means. You know, Christian, uh, you can be a political Christian. You can be a social Christian. A societal Christian. Um, there's Christian in faith. We call it, you know, there's nominal Christians. There's real Christians. You know, Christians are like a box of chocolates. <laughs> you open it up and you don't know really what you're going to get. Just because somebody says, I'm a Christian. It might be horrible nougat inside. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I didn't put that one back. You can't call them back to something they never knew. This whole idea, old school, of calling it a revival meant that there was something to revive. Now that we are under the second to the fifth generation of unchurched people, revival is less helpful to say than the least. I mean, it is totally irrelevant. You can't call them back to something they never knew. Number seven. Many have tried church, even a little, but they left. Because it wasn't a good experience. They left. Remember that. Number eight. They want you to be a Christian. Now, combine number seven. Okay? It wasn't a good experience. So many times we try, we try to make the church experience really good for them. Well, what does that mean? I think it means being friendly. You know, being, being friendly, welcoming them, helping them to feel comfortable. Um, oftentimes, not always, but in my, you know, when I tell you to turn into this place, but most people don't carry their Bibles anymore, but I'll usually tell them, hey, go to the middle of the Bible, open it up and go left or go right or, you know, help. Don't assume everybody knows where, they're, where we are in the scriptures. But this, combine that point with, you know, make them feel comfortable and loved, but don't water down what you're here for. Don't be ashamed what you're here for. Be authentic because the next thing that they want is they want you to be a Christian. Don't be sensitive for fear of hurting my feelings, not say what you really believe. Live what you believe. Do it passionately because as a, as a person out there, they're going, that's what I want to look for. That's what I want. They want you to follow Jesus authentically. Think about it. If you were going to convert a convert to Buddhism, would you want to be an authentic Buddhist, not some watered-down version? I, I have always had this idea. You know, some people say that, you know, in our Pentecostal church, if somebody sings in the spirit or speaks in tongues, you're going to scare people. And I'm like, I don't think so. You know something? I believe that when anybody walks in the door here, now, will they hear a message that maybe because of, again, we're into the fifth generation of a lot of people not going to church at all, they might be offended because they were ex expecting love means, love just means, well, you love everybody. You just do everything. It's wonderful. That hurts to even do that. <laughs> no, sometimes love is when somebody's wrong, you stand up for what's right. You stand up for it, you believe it. This is, guess what, that was wrong. That's love. 
Love is not this soft, warm. If, if you're just looking for a warm, mushy feeling, you can get that from mashed potatoes. <laughs> but they're looking. I, I just got this idea that, and, and, I, and I, we have, you know, talk to the worship team and what we do here. Hey, I want us to worship God to the very best of our ability. I'm going to preach exactly what the word says. I'm going to do it in love, but I'm going to preach this is what it says. And over the years, I can think of, I can remember many occasions, somebody right in the middle of a sermon getting up and walking out because they were offended by what they heard. That is not my fault. It's the word's fault. (laughs) It's not my fault. When I first heard the word, I was often offended. I was often bothered going, that's rather antiquated. I don't think that should be that way. It doesn't matter what I think. It's what, what does the word say? Amen? When people come in here, I think, it, it, just so you know where I'm coming from, I, man, I want us to be just really who we are. Because I think people are looking for something authentic. They're looking for this. And why would they come to church if they didn't want to meet God? When they come, they should expect to meet God here. If somebody comes in and they don't sense the presence of God, then you and I are doing something wrong. Okay, number nine. They're intelligent. Speak to them that way. You know, they're not a bunch of idiots. Don't speak down to them. Try to make it as easy as possible to be on the same page and explain things. They're not stupid. Okay, number ten. Or whatever number we're on. I don't even know where we are. Dots, okay, we're on the next dot. This, this is great. They hate hypocrisy. And in the article that I'm reading, the whole thing, it fills in, it says, enough said. They hate hypocrisy. Again, do what you believe. Express it, talk about it, live it. That's what they want. And then lastly, they love Transparency. They love it when you share your weaknesses as much as as your strengths. This idea of being authentic to who we really are. We're just real people living in a real world, worshiping a real God. We don't want to try to put on the facade that, well, we got it all together. And they're the only ones sitting in church suffering because they look around and go, oh, everybody's got their act together. Has the devil, devil ever tried to make you feel isolated that way? You're the only one? Friends, that's why to me, it's a game, it's a joke how much time and energy we as Christians put into trying to make others think that we're something that we aren't. We are sinners saved by his grace. His grace and his mercy. And the fact that he would co-labor with us is amazing. And that's what makes us feel so grateful. He'd be willing to work with us. And I don't care how long you've been a Christian, guess what? You still stink. Because now you're a a Christian, you've been so long, now you're full of self-righteousness. You need to repent. Nine minutes. Now that we only have one service, I kind of don't care. No. I, I do, I do, I do. I'm just joking with you. I'm just joking. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17, um, there's this wonderful passage trying to, you know, God is speaking and, and he really is kind of, it's kind of a challenging thought. Verses 11 through 17. God is saying to us, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord. I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of assemblies, all the special services you have. I cannot endure iniquity in the sacred meeting. It's kind of interesting. The Apostle Paul says to the Roman church, he says, when you gather together, you do more harm than good. When you come to celebrate the Lord's Supper, he says, you, your gatherings are more harm than good. That's pretty profound. Yeah. 
Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my, ho- my soul hates. They are trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Verse 17 is, verse 17 is, is the emphasis. God's speaking, he sets up all this stuff and says, because we, we know that he, he wants blood sacrifices. So we know this, but God is really making a point. He says, listen, do you think I really need that? In verse 17, he says, this is what I want you to do. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. In a very similar scripture in Micah, in fact, I read this just a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to read it again because it's just good stuff. In the book of Micah, um, he, God, he's talking, he says, so, God, what do you really want from me? And you know, as I read this passage, what you're going to see as we read it together, you're going to see this escalation. He starts off with this, and then he goes to this, to this, to this, and then he comes right down to, what, should I just give my very life in this idea of worship? Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. So what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? You see the escalation? Went from calves, now to thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And the answer basically is no. Quit trying to be so dramatic. We go through all these things and we think God's pleased it. And he goes, I, it's important to you, but it's not important to me. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly. Love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So last week, we ended with in this idea of being true to our calling. To your calling will be true in 22. Our calling is to be growing in our love for God. We'll be talking about that next week. To be growing in our service to God and growing in our commitment to the body. Yeah. Already, I hope your mind is just a little bit peaked. What does it mean to love God? We say it all the time. We've got to love God. What does that mean? Amen? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would deliver all of us from playing the game. Because we all do in different areas, in different ways, in various forms in our life. Father, we don't want to be game players. We want to walk with you. We want to love you. Things are important. And at different times, things are more important than others. Give us wisdom to make sure that we're putting an emphasis on the right syllable. Forgive us when we become self-righteous about how right we're doing it. Heavenly Father, forgive. I ask for your grace, your mercy. Because we are all on this journey. Follow me as I follow Christ is really all of our mottos. We're all on a journey. Father, we want to love you. We want to serve you. We want to be filled with your presence. We ask for your help. Fill us again. Fill us afresh with your spirit. Bring conviction in every one of our lives because we all need it. May we be broken realizing that we are all fallible. You are the only infallible one. Father, help us to live our life in such a way not by our clean haircut, not by our 
bumper stickers and our jewelry, but by our life. May our neighbors see that you're alive. In your precious name, we thank you. Amen. God is good all the time. Let's stand. All right. How can I keep from staying in your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by a king. And it makes my heart. I am loved by a king. And it makes Isn't that the truth? When you feel the love of God, it makes you want to sing. It makes you want to share the great hope that he's put in you. It, it really moves it from you have to to get to. I don't have to. I want to. Amen? Praise God. You are dismissed to love and serve God. Stay warm.